We are broadcasting to YouTube, so that will take us 10 seconds. Thank you for joining us. For some reason, it looks like it's not broadcasting. So this webinar is also recorded. So um, the, yeah, the pleasure meeting you. Goodbye. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Lirad, why won't you connection? Uh, let's try again. Lirad, why won't you start? Uh, it looks like we're live on YouTube from what I hear. Oh, yeah? Uh, okay. So, yeah, yeah, let's get going. So it's my Perfect. pleasure to uh, introduce Mr. Jan Gell. Um, needs really no, no introduction, I'm sure, to the majority of people who are joining us today, but uh, I'll say a few words. So uh, Mr. Gell is one of the most iconic, influential urban planners of our generation. Uh, he co-founded Gell Architects in 2000 and is currently a senior advisor. Over the course of his long and storied career, he has published several books, including Life Between Buildings, Cities for People, New City Spaces, and most recently, People Cities, uh, all of which have been published in over 40 languages. Jan and his team have had a profound impact on the urban fabric of cities, including Copenhagen, London, Sydney, New York, Moscow, and even Toronto. So uh, enough from me, I want to turn it over to the man of the hour. So, uh, Mr. Gell, in short, uh, can you just give us uh, an overview of your story, how you started your professional practice, your business, and what is it that put you on the map? Well, 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 long story, long, long career. Uh, this last year, it was 60 years since I graduated as an architect, and I've been full time architect and urban designer now ever since. Um, just in these days, I'm writing on the next volume, which will be a 50 year anniversary book, because it's 50 years since Life Between Buildings was first published in Scandinavia in 1971. And uh, in this connection, I, I'm just putting down why I came, how I came into this area of urban design. And I've told it a number of times, but the story goes like this, that when just after I graduated as an architect, I married a young psychologist. And then of course, we started to discuss what the social sciences were interested in and what the architects and planners were interested in. And we found that there was an enormous gap between these professions. And then we also stared out into the suburbs with horror and saw what was going on in the 60s, which was a period of very rapid growth of the car fleet of the country. Um, I think we had um, at that time 200 cars rolling in extra every day in 10 years time in the 60s in a small little country of 5 million people. So the cars completely swept over everything. And at the same time, we saw the suburbs spreading with all these single family houses and with all these modernistic block buildings, which were then made of concrete and industrialized. And they were high buildings and long buildings and silly buildings, all of them very, very boring. And we thought we, we were very, we were harmed in our little family. We discussed this 
and we thought that it was a shame for, for mankind that they had to live in these places where so little consideration for the well-being of people had been invested. I knew that because I was just freshly educated. We heard not a word about people in my education. And that then it came to that we started to work, each of us, in my wife Ingrid and I, she worked in this building research institute where she wrote a very excellent book about psychological aspects of living. And at the same time, I was invited to come and study at the Royal Academy of Fine Arts School of Architecture in Copenhagen. Um, and the first thing Ingrid and I did after all our our concern with the suburbs were that we got a grant to go to Italy to see what nice cities were, how they were built and what people used nice cities for, how they used them. And that was the start of my work on observing how things were used and systematizing these knowledge and putting it into textbooks and saying, if this is what you like, this is what you should do. This is what we have overlooked, all this. And the result of all this was in 1971, the book, Life Between Buildings. Then I had 40 years of research and teaching. And I didn't thought a thing about being in, um, in an office and having a company, whatever. I was a research person and uh, we're doing a number of books and having a great life with the students and oh, oh. And then as we came further up, um, I worked all the time with Copenhagen because that was our laboratory. And after a while, the politicians and the planners of Copenhagen started to lean towards the School of Architecture to hear what they should do next. And after a while again, we started to work really closely together, gown and town together. And then Oslo in Norway and Stockholm in Sweden came running to this School of Architecture and said, Jan, you must come and help us also as you have helped Copenhagen. Then we did something for both Oslo and Stockholm. And then I was invited to give a talk in Perth in Australia where I talked about the work we were doing in Copenhagen and Stockholm. And then they said, you must come and help us to put Perth Street. Then they talked to Adelaide and Adelaide talked to Melbourne, Melbourne talked to Sydney. And then more and more things popped up. And, and in 2000, I had to formalize all this because we were doing these consultancies with my left hand. I was still a professor at School of Architecture. And we did it from my home and my wife's same wife, by the way, of course. She said, I'll not accept you have six students for breakfast every day or whatever. It was growing. And she said, you have to organize. And we organized with one of the students, Hele Søholdt. And by 2000, we formed the company Gale Architects. I was at the age of 63 at that point. And then it started to, to move, uh, to grow. So it's actually, my story is that it is research, very basic research, which gradually was implemented into real life, not by my doing, but because people asked me, they said, you can criticize all that we are doing, but couldn't you come and show us what we shall do yourself? That was why I decided to be a consultant also. That was maybe an answer to your first question, maybe. Yep, no, it definitely was. And, uh, and, and just to build on that, so, um, you know, word of mouth got out, but how did you go from a handful of cities to, you know, operating in over 26 countries? How did that, uh, it seemed like it was fairly rapid growth as well. There are 
one thing which is important that was that um, having started to publish already in 1971 and starting our research in the mid 60s when nothing was known about how the physical world and the social world were connected and what influence what we built had on what kind of quality of life people could have nothing was known so it was really my privilege to be one of the first ones or the pioneers who took up this sector and started to do research and i did this life between buildings which this year is 50 years old and we can look back at the story of, of that book and it's still coming out in new languages this year it was Saudi Arabia, last year it was Iceland, and it's still available in many countries and coming out in reprints and new editions. So that was really a book which, which became a classic. And that means that it was my privilege to be one of the first. And for that reason, many people were interested in the stuff we made. And because of this research background and because of the books which were rather quickly spread all over the world uh, the later the books were published the more they were spread the book uh, cities for people is out in 38 languages and um, all of them are about out in more than 40 languages and this is the reason why we I got involved in so many countries and regions in the world because my books were out there. People were, were very excited about the books and about this pointing out that whatever you do as an architect, you manipulate with the possibilities of people and the quality of their lives. But most architects do not really know how they manipulate and, and to what extent. And that was some of the things we started to make known. And then of course, if you can manipulate, you can as well manipulate in a direction so that the cities become better um, and not necessarily worse for the changes. And that was so much in demand. So I really have felt that because of the very easy spreading of the books that there must have been an enormous hunger worldwide for information about people in relation to architecture and planning and also there was just as much hunger to have some ideas and some instruction about how you could make cities better how you could improve cities and how you could make better new projects because while it was relatively easy to improve existing cities, which were built with nice spaces, which were only invaded by motor cars. So in the old cities, it was mainly to come in and clean up after the motor cars and people could start to have a good time again. But in the new towns, they were based on the automobile. They were based on modernism. They were spread out that's much more complicated. So while it generally went better in the improving the old cities, I still think that much of the new stuff is really horrible. And that these, these humanistic principle has not really been widely used in new developments in new towns. At one point, I think it was five years ago, we started to make a new book called Great New Towns of the 21st Century. And after just half a year of research, we found it would be the thinnest book in the world. We had only found two, three examples, which we thought was really worthwhile talking about. So it was a depressing journey. Um, wh what? That was 26 countries for you. 
what what you are saying and talking about is very much applicable to North America and Toronto, probably even more so than it does to to just Copenhagen. What advice would you like to give next generation of urban designers? Uh, we are joined here today by more than 700 people. So what what advice would you give urban designers today? Of course, it is my not only my opinion, but I have studied it, so I know what I'm talking about. I do think that we, to a much higher extent, should take a departure point in the life of the people and in knowledge about how people behave, how the senses work, and how the communication, how we interact with other people, all this basic information about homo sapiens. If that is applied, to architecture and urban design, we can have much better projects than, than the many of the ones we get anyway. So I really think that knowledge of people and of homo sapiens and who we are and what we and what our aspirations are, that could, that is a very good a way to improve um, the world and improve our professions. And I will advise the young people to be sure to, to be humble and start with the people and not be too sure that if it looks good, it will work well. That is not correct. Uh, that was for many years, that was taught in all the schools of architecture that the aesthetics, if they were all right, everything would be fine. They are, it's not. There are so many other things but it's not complicated. It's all in here. Th thank you for that. Um, can you share with us some of the other sides of working internationally? What are the challenges that, you know, the glamorous uh, aspects of that are, are not shown? What, what are the, how is it to run a practice that, you know, works in 26 countries? What are the what other aspects we're not aware of? Of course, for me, it's been a fantastic opportunity to be one of the first and to have this speciality in an area where everybody was very eager to, to try to have some of these humanistic principles applied. So it's generally been extremely easy to work because there was so much understanding for the importance of this. And uh, of course, um, having worked in North America, South America, Europe, Asia, the Arab countries, and Australia, New Zealand, and the Far East, China, um, you learn a lot of cultures, you meet a lot of uh, professional of colleagues, and um, you have many different working situations. Um, one of the, uh, I also learned that some of the things uh, work well, and some of the things, some of the things work so that actually it's being done, and you can go 10 years later and see, wow, this is it. And some of the places, you are very depressed because nothing happens you do a big work and, and make a big report and recommend this and that. And then there is silence. This experience I had with London. I, we did a very big work in London in 2004 for the mayor, then mayor, Ken Livingston. And with the um, uh, Richard Rogers was the advisor to the mayor about uh, quality of cities. And we did this, and they said, we'll do it all. And then Boris Johnson came into power. Um, and then we have heard very little about all these ideas. On the contrary, I have fantastic results seen, done, things done in Australia. Actually, in all the Australian cities, I, we have been working and I've had fantastic experiences where things have been carried out, where cities have been changed dramatically to the better. Um, in North America, we have worked, of course, in New York, 
which was a great experience. Again, that was a situation where there was a strong mayor and a strong uh, urban setup so that the mayor could realize his ideas. Um, I found in other cities in North America that, that they don't have such a strong setup as they have in New York. In New York, it was really possible to change Times Square and to put in the bike lanes and all this stuff. Um, in other North American cities, it's been much harder. And I realized, of course, that the cities in Australia, they are stronger than the cities in North America. Or the population are more eager to see better quality of life than in more in North America. I don't quite know. But the most efficient, of course, was working for Moscow because they have a very efficient democracy. And they just did it almost before we, we, we explained it or told about it, it was done. And Moscow has made a fantastic turnaround. And of course, um, I believe strongly in democracy, but it's also nice to see things being done. <laughs> and to, in Moscow, there's been a fantastic improvement of quality, which of course is nice. Uh, of course, the methods used, I don't know too much about, but the result was good. And Jan, how was your experience um, consulting in Toronto? Uh, and then as a, as a follow-up question, beyond working here, um, what would you like to change with our city and what do you think Toronto can, can do better? Yeah, I can tell you guys something. That is that I am in my heart half a Canadian because early in my career, just after I wrote um, Life Between Buildings, my wife and I, we went to Toronto where I was teaching at U of T uh, in the year 72, 73. And that was a very interesting year because there was the old development city council which was pushed out by David Crombie and the reform group. Actually, I was in Toronto at the time and, and actually participated in the campaign for Crombie, mainly because my, my daughter of five was involved with the son of Crombie who was in the same neighborhood, but that's another story. But I came to love Toronto very much. I, thought that the old neighborhoods were extremely fine. We lived in North Toronto. And of course, I went around and, and, and we saw the, the new uh, town hall. And, uh, and I, I asked all these questions, why don't you do something about Young Street or Bluer Street? Or um, couldn't some of these ideas, which have been so successful in other countries, couldn't they be applied to here? And uh, so there were discussions, but not more than discussions. And actually, I, I feel very much a déjà vu when I come back to Toronto now, almost 50 years later, and see the same problems and the same narrow sidewalks and the same this and that. Um, but there has been some improvements, especially at a certain time, there were some very nice areas along the waterfront where Toronto actually was one of the leading nations, uh, cities in the world in improving the waterfront. I think that was in the beginning a very nice operation. I don't quite know if they have kept up the good intentions from the early days. They have built too many high buildings down there though, um, which blocks out the waterfront from the city, which I'm not so happy about. But I really feel that Toronto from time to time has been really much on, on a track to something good. And then it's gone off in another direction. And uh, I, I'm not so sure about that. I think it's among the urban design wise among the best cities in the world. I think that many other cities have done much more and better. 
Yes, we but, definitely have a lot of, there is, uh, a lot of there work. Is, there is a potential, indeed. <laughs> For sure, absolutely. Actually, let's stay on, the, on Toronto. Um, let's talk about community consultation because we have, I, it's a very, very challenging uh, process here in Toronto to work with the community when uh, not in my backyard attitude, it comes uh, again and again. Um, what, what advice could you give us on having better in a truly uh, informed community from your experience? I think you said something very central here, a truly informed community. I do think I really believe in information and education that if it's really conveyed to the neighborhoods what you could do, what they've done other places, what your city could look like um, if, if it's not the developers and the traffic engineers who decide everything. If you really show, would you like here to live here or would you like this way? People have a very sure hand in picking good places. So I really think that information is a key word to all this. We have in Copenhagen, over all these 50 years where I worked in this area, we have all the time kept a very high level of information about why this is done, why this could be better, why, um, how other people have done and how we could apply this to the local scene. And that means that in Copenhagen, we sometimes are said to be one of the most livable cities in the world. What, what, what is realized is that it's been possible to change the general mindset all the way from the Lord Mayor and the city architect to the lowliest architecture students, but more important to a great part of the population who realize this is the way we do. Of course, we make livable city situations here in Copenhagen. That's the way to go. That's the way we do it. So changing our mindset always have to go before changing the city. If you change the mindset, the city will be changed for sure. So work on the mindset. I want to ask one more question before our last question. Um, the, the, you know, it's real as, as a young practice, uh, it's really hard to, to work in the public sector. Uh, if anyone is listening, it is, you should know, anyone from, uh, from cities, uh, it, it is really hard for, for a younger practice. What advice could you give about working with the public sector or working with municipalities? It is a different client than the private sector. What, uh, what can you tell us? What can you teach us? I don't think there are any fixed rules because uh, may, uh, from my experience, many of the public sector works, they have had much better client than the private sector with developers and profit motives. Uh, often, I found that cities have been very altruistic and want to do the best. Um, they may be a bit slow from time to time, but sometimes they are much more eager to do the good thing than the private companies, which are sometimes very eager to do the profitable thing. So I don't think one can say that always the public sector is slow and more difficult to work with. But again, to me, it's very much the mindset that if the politicians and the public, the city officers really understand, which if you have abilities to show what it could be and what they did in other places, then suddenly there's a conversation going and it's much better and easier to get changes done. So again, mindset is a key word. Absolutely. Looking back at your career, what advice would you give your younger, the younger young girl? <laughs> I realized that I have been 
in this business at right at just about the right time. Uh, it was it was being graduating in the 60s and starting working in the 60s and having been had time to do quite a bit of research and then apply the research to real life. That has been a fantastic privilege and also a very strong basis for working because we really came to know a lot. We started by knowing not a thing. And then 50 years later, we could say, we know how to do it. And that's a fantastic strength. But my advice would really be to, um, I know that there is in the schools of architecture, there of course are uh, strong forces saying that architecture is the important thing that Aesthetics is the important thing, that form is the important thing. And uh, you can be a star architect if you can make funny forms. So train in making funny forms. But I really think that the key to quality of life and to better cities and to better housing schemes and also better office parks and whatever, that is really um, to take to, to respect the people who are to live there and work there and try to work from the bottom up instead of hanging over the model and putting the buildings around until you have a nice pattern saying, wow, this must be good because the pattern is so beautiful. Take your mind and do a walk through this area and find out how, how a child would be in this area and how it would be to be old and mind that there are so many more older people now than when I started working. And that is a very important group in our uh, constituency. So be humble and work from the bottom up and have deep respect for people, but also for architecture and all the fantastic things we as architects can do if we are not arrogant, but sufficiently humble and listening to what's going on. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. I, uh, needless to say, I'm so honored to have that conversation. I, uh, I'm, I belong to, you know, many, many other students who studied your work in school and, uh, and I'm beyond honored to have this conversation. So thank you very much uh, for being here with us. We try to keep our webinars for 30 minutes, so we are right on time. Um, for those of you who are here for the first time, uh, From the Ground Up is a webinar series talking to founders of uh, the most successful companies in the industry. And uh, Mr. Gill is our first international speaker. Uh, hopefully more will follow. Um, I'm Nama Blonder. I'm an architect and urban planner with Smart Density, and my co-host and dear friend is Lirad Kligman, the co-founder of the Yorkville team, a residential and commercial sales team in Toronto. Please join us in two weeks' time for our uh, next webinar with Shirley Bloomberg from KPMB Architects. And thank you again, and all the best. Thank you. Thank you very You're much, welcome. Mr. Gale. You're welcome. Thank you. And you from the, the Yorkville Association. <laughs> I like that place and I like that park. <laughs> yes, it is.